to all those from Rome who are joining us. Um, thank you for all for coming here on time. And we are we have a very busy and tight program. So as much as we can start and keep on time, it would be best so that we get to hear from all our esteemed speakers uh, on some excellent experiences that we hope we will hear from them. And, um, and then we can have a discussion towards the end of the program. So it's exactly one o'clock here in Bangkok. Um, so colleagues, this excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this FAO webinar on stock taking and lessons learned from the implementation of the one village, one product in Asia and the Pacific. And without any further ado, I'll straight away invite our, um, uh, the head of our office, the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative of the Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific uh, to deliver his opening remarks and welcome everybody. Over to you, JJ. Thank you, uh, Sharita. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, excellencies, uh, participants, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first express uh, deep appreciation uh, to the governments of Cambodia, India, Republic of Korea, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam, and uh, many other member countries of the region for participation in this webinar. And also I want to thank those countries which uh, uh, have sent their most competent experts uh, to share uh, the experiences, knowledge, and the lessons around uh, on uh, One Village, One Product uh, initiative or a similar homegrown initiative today. This webinar is organized in the context of a, a very important new initiative launched by the FAO Director General, which we call One Country, One Community Initiative. This initiative is uh, designed to focus on a special agro product identified by each country that have a comparative advantage and a particular relevance to home and abroad. Basically, this initiative is to promote the agri-food system transformation, which is the topic of a forthcoming UN Food System Summit in September. We expect that with this initiative, the food value chain of those products, agricultural products, would become more inclusive, profitable, and environmentally sustainable. We are very happy to learn that this concept, one village, one commodity, or one community, one product, or one country, one commodity, is inspiring and uh, well aligned with uh, the SDG uh, principles. As we all know, this region holds a rich experience in such initiative. This region is characterized with diversity, fast growing economy, and the big population, and the origin of many innovations and the digitalizations. We have uh, big countries in the region like China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. We have also small countries like, uh, you know, small island uh, state, uh, uh, such as seas, we call it. We have landlocked countries and the less developed countries, as well as middle-income countries. They have a different agenda, different priorities, but I think that there are some commonalities. Through this uh, one village, one product, or similar initiative, they are aiming at 
alleviating rural poverty. Or for some advanced economies like China, Japan, and Korea. Still, they have disparity between rural and urban uh, population. Through this uh, initiative, they promote the increase of uh, income, revitalization of the rural community, and even modernization. Indeed, many Asian countries have become motivated to develop similar initiative to fit the country-specific context and their development, uh, development needs or socio-economic and environmental needs. Just to uh, name a few examples, this Tambon One product in Thailand or one commune, one product in Vietnam. One district, one product in India. And uh, there are similar uh, initiatives in Cambodia, Nepal, Korea, and others. We do appreciate this uh, diversity, which is the key objective of our uh, webinar today to gather first-hand experience and lessons we've learned uh, from those initiatives. Many of them homegrown. On this basis, we would like to identify the gaps, the key elements necessary to uh, make success of this initiative, and hopefully to develop regional prototypes to help and support member countries in the region to implement uh, those initiatives. We believe this initiative is to be country-driven, evidence-based with a holistic approach to accelerate, accelerate the achievement of sustainable development goals. So the initiative will build on what has been established already, and more importantly, to bring added value to those countries during its, uh, its implementation. We are very happy to gather authorities and experts from Cambodia, India, Korea, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam, quite diverse countries to share their national ex uh, experiences uh, in the implementation of those initiatives. We are keen to learn. We really want to uh, well understand the experiences and the lessons around from those countries. What has been achieved? What factors made them a success? What gaps or challenges were discovered during the implementation? And what expectations or recommendations they may have or they may uh, want to share with the FAO to move forward this FAO One Country One Community Initiative. We are launching a new strategic frame, which is to accelerate the achievements, the SDGs in this decade, with the four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. I think this initiative is an important means to achieve these four betters. I very much look forward to learn from your experiences. With this, uh, let me conclude my brief introductory remarks. Thank you very much, 
uh, I look forward to uh, very fruitful, useful presentation and discussions. Also, I want to thank uh, colleagues in the headquarters in Rome who are joining uh, at very early morning. Thank you very much for your interest and the support. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, JJ, and um, thank you for setting the background to this webinar almost immediately. And to build further on it, I now invite Ms. Shuan Li, the Senior Policy Officer at the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, and the lead on this initiative from this region on one country, one commodity. So I invite Shuan to set the scene and provide us an overview of the objectives and the expected outcomes today. Over to you, Shuan. Thank you, Shreda. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, as Mr. Chin um, and Kim uh, highlighted, the, this webinar is organized in the context of the FAO Director General's new initiative on one country, uh, one commodity. So my presentation is trying to give more background, um, which covers four parts. Uh, start from the what is the one country, one commodity initiative, followed by an overview of the one village, one product movement in Asia Pacific region. And it will um, discuss what is connection between the OVLP and OCLC, and then um, to give the structure of today's seminar. So about background of the, our um, uh, OCOC, actually that one commodity is uh, referring to their special agro product. And this is the in referring to their, um, their uh, one, a type of their agriculture product that is their um, currently or potentially recognized as unique in terms of national identity or in terms of flavor of an um, of nutrient content and also attract the domestic or international market. Knowing their special agro product facing a lot of challenges. And this OCOC initiative is designed to address the challenges and turn into their um, opportunities. So what is the rationale of the OCOC initiative? It is intended to support countries to achieve SDGs and also in line with the digital vision on the four betters, that is um, for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. The major approaches of the OCOC initiative, um, here are a few keywords I want to uh, highlight. One is the country-led uh, implementation, is demand-driven, comparative advantage-oriented, green technology mainstreamed, food chain-based, multidisciplinary involved and also multi-stakeholder engaged. So we're expecting the key actions for OCOC include promotion of the green production, green storage, green processing, and green market access. The major output of the OCOC include uh, not uh, limited, including their established their uh, green technology transfer center of the excellence. We expand, uh, ex expand of their green technology package for the whole food chain. Develop a set of the green enabler like the policy standard, food production, storage, processing, etc. cetera, food special product. And also set up the market uh, access platform at different level. It also uh, intends to formulate a quality mechanism to promote uh, the special product um, there, uh, at different uh, level as well. In terms of outcome, it is intended to be in line with the sustainability from the economical, social, and ecological um, and environmental uh, perspectives. So this is about briefly about OCLC. And as um, JJ and the, uh, ADG mentioned, we have very rich OVOP initiative. And what is the um, OVOP? We know OVOP originated in Japan in Oita in 1979. And it established three major principles of this movement, local yet global, secondly, self-reliance and creativity, and third one, human resource development. And this principle has been widely accepted and still be uh, effective in many countries today. 
It also established the basic schemes with the four pillars of this movement, um, as we see the figure here. And very um, uh, enlightening um, with the good outcome that OBOP achieved in Japan. It has been widely um, their addressed attention in the region and globally. For instance, China is one of the early adopters um, of their OVLP uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the country in 90, uh, early 1980s. And many other Asian countries follow this model. And we were going to see um, OVLP and other similar home initiatives. They established their and tailor made to their own objectives, approaches, governance, and outcomes in each and every country. So here is, here is a one of the long exhaustive list of the country OBOP programs in Asia. At least 15 countries have developed um, this OBOP or a similar initiative with a somehow different uh, objective and, and modality um, in the country. As you can see, some are more focused on the economical, some are more focused on the social, some are cultural, some are all in combination of the three different objectives. And in terms of approach, country, um, some picked up the uh, top down, some are preferred to the bottom up. And I have to say many countries actually took up their uh, mixed approach, but all of them contributed to the SDG, especially to their SDG 1, 2, and 10, and the 12. In terms of governance structure, we also see the quite diversified uh, their uh, modality. Some are from their um, local or provisional prefecture level, uh, like Japan. Some other countries like in Cambodia, um, Thailand, is not from their the structure over from the prime minister and all the level from the national, um, provisional, local, community level. But of course, while talking about diversity, there were a lot of common features but I don't want to go uh, details here. We're gonna hear more details in the national um, presentation uh, soon after. But some key words we can see is the effective leadership and strong governance is very important. And the value chain development and SMAE are common um, issues that each and every country addressed and, um, and creativity and self-reliance for the community level is key. So after talking about uh, OVOP, actually the key we want to do uh, is building this connection between the OVOP to the OCOC. This is because of the Asia has a solid background and, uh, and experience on the, on the OVOP. And FAO region office intends to bridge the gaps and bring innovation and value addition for the countries as the ADG highlighted. So what is the um, what is connection here? We want to build in all the lessons learned and the expected gaps and challenges that we're facing at national implementation of the OBOP in order to bring those element, both what worked well and what did work well into the regional development of the prototype uh, on the OCOC. We are adopting this um, um, holistic food system and value chain development approach and bring the different um, the, um, uh, stakeholders at community, district, provisional, national, regional, and global levels, trying to support our uh, farmers uh, throughout the whole value chain. We hope that we could connect all the three uh, industries together. So about today's uh, webinar, objective is to stay, take stock on the national experience of the OVOP or similar um, homegrown initiatives. And secondly, is to draw lessons and identify key elements in developing and implementation of this OCOC initiative in this region. The major output, three part. First, to, to share knowledge and experience on ongoing OVOP initiative. Secondly, to identify the element necessary for the successful implementation. Number three, we want to propose a roadmap for the regional prototype. The outline of our webinar today, after the op opening remarks and this set scene, we were going to hear the country presentation on the OVOP implementation. This covers from Cambodia, South Korea, India, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. Afterwards, we're going to have the open discussions with all the panelists and all the participants. 
It will be wrapped up and closed by Mr. Zhong Jing Kim, our original uh, ADG. So are you ready for the exciting national experience? Let's go. Thank you very much. Back to you, Shrita. Thank you, Shuan, and for providing us that, that excellent overview of OVOP in the region. And indeed, uh, we do look forward now to a very exciting afternoon. And as we have been speaking, our audience has crossed 100. So it's very great to see the turnout and participation for this meeting. Before I turn it over to all the speakers uh, who are online, let me first thank, the, thank them for their patience, their commitment, and their understanding in helping us to pre-record their, their presentations. And we'll be playing them one by one in alphabetical order. Uh, let me also inform everyone that uh, we will be live tweeting. Our social media team is live tweeting this event. So please keep your smiles as wide as possible. And to the audience, I would request, uh, you're all most welcome during these presentations or while we are playing the videos to put in any questions that you might have to the presenters on the chat, or you could use the Q&A box where you can address any of the speakers directly with their name and request them for a response. So you can start the conversation even while we are playing these videos one by one. So to start off um, the presentations, we'll first have the first, um, the, the presentation from Cambodia. And, uh, uh, and this presentation has been made by His Excellency, Dr. Chia Samnak, the Secretary General of One Village, One Product, the Director of the Deputy Prime Minister's Cabinet of the Council for Agriculture and Rural Development in Cambodia. Thank you, Mr. Samnak, for recording this for us. And I now request the Secretariat, please play the video from Cambodia. Uh, Mr. Samnak, we will play the video. You can stop sharing your screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just looking for... Uh... Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Secretary, please play the video. So good, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to join the webinar meeting uh, for the uh, One Country, One Commodity, OCOC, that organized by the FAO. Uh, regional office. Thank you for allowing me to introduce the OVOP in Cambodia. Uh, one is the background of the OVOP movement in Cambodia. Uh, second, uh, my presentation is the three key principles of OVOP movement. Uh, number three is the vision of the Cambodian OVOP movement. And number four is the structure of the national and subnational of the OVOP movement in Cambodia. At number five, I'm talking about the OVOP uh, product definition. As you already know that uh, uh, each country, if we look at a local product, have so many kind, uh, many different kinds of the product. So in here, uh, we will identify some of the key products in the OVOP movement. Uh, number six, I'm talking about the uh, regulation framework, or we can call it like the enabling environment to support the OVOP implementation. And number seven, we will classify the group product in the OVOP context of Cambodia. And number eight is the lesson learned that we are implementing this OVOP in Cambodia. So actually the uh, characteristic of the local product in the concept-based OVOP approach have been uh, happened in Cambodia a long time ago. Uh, such as like in the one of the province in the north, is we have one province they produce the we call it clay product that mean uh, few community in their uh, in their province they uh, doing the business clay product so many uh, generation you know until now it's still uh, do it by the the uh, young generation in the family so that's why we consider that OVRP approach uh, not just only um, be learning from Japan but if you look at our history. In some province already uh, do it, uh, the village product like that. 
Okay, so starting from 2001, uh, Cambodian delegation led by our Prime Minister, uh, we had a state visit to Japan. And on that time, the delegation also had a chance to visit the Oita Prefecture and to see and learn about the OVOP in their provinces. So now let's talk about the uh, former organization in, in, in Cambodia. Uh, in the context of the OVOP. Uh, based on the agricultural cooperative law in 2013, at the moment we have uh, 1,200 agriculture cooperative in the country. Uh, and then we have approximately around uh, 13,000 farmer organizations that register at the Ministry of Agriculture. And we have uh, 662 farmer associations that register at the MOI, but if you are doing the business, uh, you have to register another one at the Ministry of Commerce. So if they run the operational agriculture business. Uh, for farmer community, we have uh, around 1,700 uh, community. That one include the farmer water use group and irrigation system. Uh, for the farmer income, uh, we got the uh, roughly information It's about 1,200 uh, US dollars per year. But the Ministry of Agriculture, they have a target in 2030, it's about uh, 2,000 US per year. And the key three principles of uh, this uh, OVOP, that is the human resources development. I think this one is very important in the key principle or in the OVOP uh, concept. In, in Cambodia as well as in other countries as well, I believe. So uh, we, we need to build the capacity, not only the community, but also at the uh, government employee or OVOP staff at national and sub-national uh, level. I think the reason of our OVOP movement in Cambodia, we are uh, expect to contribute the implementation of the national strategy for poverty reduction that we are uh, uh, addressing to the local people for uh, better up in the family by uh, mobilizing local economic potential of the products and services at the community. And number two, our vision is to help the people to feel confident and sell, sell, sell help and satisfaction and pride in producing good and services by their own at the community. And number three, we be, believe that our further aim of the OVOP movement is contribute to sustainable economic development in the country. That the government have said that Cambodian uh, country will become the higher middle income country by 2030 and high income country by 2050. So this slide I'm showing the organizational uh, organ, organ structure of the OVOP movement. So as I said in before, right now the Prime Minister is not the chairman anymore. He is the Honorable Chair of the National OVOP Committee. And Excellency Deputy Prime Minister Yom Cheli, uh, the Chairman of the Council for Agricultural and Rural Development, we call CARD. Uh, he also appointed as the Chairman of the OVOP National Committee. And uh, the first deputy of the uh, National Committee, uh, that is the Minister of Commerce, is the, vice, uh, the first vice chairman. And at the above, uh, I mean that in the level of the uh, chairman and vice chairman, we have uh, uh, some of the senior, uh, senior staff of the government as the vice chairman also. But the Minister of Commerce is the first vice chairman of this committee. From left side, uh, we have 16 ministry and five institution and 25 provincial governor as the member of the OVOP National Committee. Uh, below, below that one, we also have the OVOP task force, but OVOP task force here, we are not created all of the 16 ministry or five institution like that. So we select key ministry that becomes the, the secretariat of OVOP working more, uh, more often, then we ask them to create the OVOP task force. Mm. So this is from left side of the line ministry. 
from right side, we have the OBOP Secretariat General, that is my position in here. And we have four departments under the Secretary General. We have the finance admin, we have the uh, research and development, we have marketing and standard, and we have the public relations. So this is the department level and the uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General of the OBOP. At provincial level, uh, Cambodian, we have uh, one municipality and 24 provinces. Uh, one municipality and 24 provinces, we uh, all that province and municipality, we have the OVOP committee. But, uh, if we talk about the one village, it's not mean one village have to do the one product like that. It could be two, three, or one, or four, or five villages that they can produce very unique product in their community. So this is one of the definition of the OVOP that we refer. And second one, the product reflect to ancient or modern culture. And number three, the, that product need to be uh, have the you know uh, possible to strengthening and to expanding in the quality quality and body to create the value added for the price of the product and the last one if we if we call the OVOP product it means that product have to be registered in OVOP system and endorsed by the OVOP national committee when uh, product group for the OVOP one is the food and beverage, like the local whiskey made by banana, passion, etc. We ask uh, number two, uh, the product we classify in souvenir product like seal, handmade, bamboo, wood, stone, etc. And art craft like the clay. Uh, number three, we talk about the herbal and supplementary food that also part of the local product. Uh, that is under uh, working closely with Ministry of Health and textile, like silk, cotton, or krama. So number five is the furniture, like the bamboo, rattan wood. And number six is services, like homestay, eco-tourism site, etc. And number seven is domestic or decoration. So I show you, this is the picture of some of the local products that um, uh, choose some of the uh, uh, beautiful product to show you. Uh, what is the uh, enabling environment that we support OVOP implementation in Cambodia. So we have the royal decree, we have the sub decree, we have the decision of establishment of OVOP National Committee. Actually, the establishment of OVOP National Committee should be signed by the king. So that's the one we call royal decree. Why? You know, in order to promote the local product, the government have uh, issued the, uh, we call it the, uh, the uh, decision to establish the national day of the promoting Cambodian made product in 9 April every year. So uh, actually in April 13, that is the year for us to celebrate a Khmer New Year, Cambodian New Year. So that's why uh, we want to uh, organize the National Day uh, to promote the Cambodian made product on 9 April. So what is the key lesson learned of the implementation? So I think that uh, what is the uh, most important that we learn is the coordination mechanism at the national and sub-national. You know, the national committee is not the, uh, the ministry. We are uh, the policy body, we are the coordination body, and we are uh, providing some of the evidence base. The, the key lesson number two, that is the capacity development <clears throat> that we have to uh, Bill for our national team and our sub-national team, I mean, uh, at the OVOP Provincial Committee. Uh, number three, the partnership. I think uh, partnership is very important that uh, we are not looking for the government side, but we also looking partnership with the academic side, with the Royal uh, Agriculture University, you know, Royal Academy of Cambodia and Cambodian Technology Institute, something like that. That, that, that is the uh, academic uh, institution that we need to uh, to be partner with them and invite them to uh, uh, participate in the OVOP movement. Uh, beside that one, we are also looking for the private sector participation. So uh, we have the contract with the, not contract, I mean that uh, MOU with the Super Ed Technology is the local company that they're doing business by the, uh, by the online. So we invite them to participate to partnership with us. 
We also have the partnership with the local media, even the state-owned media or the private media. So number four, we stand on firmly to the three key principles that I already mentioned in OVOP global uh, key principle that is in globally, agriculturally, so rely on human resources development. And number four, we had the political support to the OVOP implementation, you know, uh, such as like the government have decided to establish the national day for uh, promotion of the Cambodian made product in 9 April every year. So this is one of the key, uh, key element that uh, political support to the OVOP implementation in Cambodia. And the last one of the key lesson learned, we are uh, finding the uh, OVOP product, uh, I mean that market for OVOP product. So in doing that one, we organize yearly of the uh, uh, exhibition product through the National Day. And also we have the uh, joining with the Ministry of Commerce for distribution as well. Uh, we recommend them to solve the challenges that we face during the implementation. So to solve that one, I think the capacity development to OVOP staff is very important. Yeah, not just only uh, community, but also at yeah, national team and sub-national team. Uh, for community training, I think the skill training to local community is also uh, uh, important, including uh, in, uh, information, uh, communication, and technology, ICT. Uh, number three, the uh, challenges that we face, that is the local government commitment and facilitation. I think uh, financial resources is very uh, important for SME or for agriculture uh, producer or non-agriculture producer. So in order to that one, besides of the uh, national budget to support the OVOP uh, national committee or some national committee to com uh, the financial partnership with the private sector or other key or the key stakeholder is very important for improving uh, product. Uh, number five, uh, improving our product and services in terms of quality and safety. So this is uh, very important to respond to the uh, safety food or good quality that we can com uh, competition in the uh, domestic market or international market in, in the context of the free market uh, system. Uh, the number six is promotion of value chain for OVOP product. Uh, that means the consideration mostly agriculture marketing activity that we link linkages through the production, processing, packaging, storage, and market-based uh, places in local and overseas uh, market. And the last one is the monitoring uh, research uh, development for innovation idea to the local community. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Excellency, uh, for that ex for that presentation on Cambodia, and for actually emphasizing the importance of strong coordination at all levels on partnership, and the idea of having a national day is a great advocacy idea. So, and while you were speaking, Excellency, there are a couple of questions in the chat. There are also questions in the Q&A, which any of the speakers can go ahead and answer. If they feel like you can have multiple answers to any of the questions as well. So we'll now move on to the country presentation from the Republic of Korea. And this presentation is from Dr. Hyo Jung Lee, Associate Research Fellow and Team Leader of International Cooperation and Strategy at the Korea Rural Economy Institute. Uh, Secretary, please play the video from Korea. Unlike most developing countries, Korea does not have a large rural population. First of all, I think it will be helpful for you to understand the rural convergence industry in Korea by briefly explaining the rural conditions in Korea. Next, I will explain how the rural convergence industry has been fostered at the regional level, then a case study of regional network an analysis of rural convergence industry is explained. And finally, I will make 
implications and policy suggestions. Before explaining the Korean case in earnest, I would like to increase my understanding of the rural uh, areas of Korea. In Korean government has tried to a variety of policies to keep pace with demographic and social changes. In particular, policies directly related to the topic of the today webinar, OVOP, are being promoted. Since the mid-20s, 2000s, the Korean government has been pursuing a full-scale rural industrialization policy. We are attempting to promote secondary or territory industrial activities by utilizing resources with pluralistic values in agriculture and rural areas. The project to foster regional specialties was carried out from 2008 to 2010. This program has been continued as a project to support and the industrialization of rural resources from 2010 to the present. In addition, project to foster local agricultural clusters have been ongoing since 2005. The slide you see now shows how Korea's rural convergence industry policy has changed since the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. Contents and major projects are divided based on five categories. Secondary uh, processing and experimental tourism services and uh, rural uh, industrial base and social uh, economic uh, conditions uh, and local uh, revitalizations. Until the 1980s, projects such as Semal Factory, which were accumulated for industrialization of agriculture and carried out during the uh, Sema Lundong in the 1970s were continuing. In the 1990s, various support projects were supported to foster the processing industry based on agriculture, and the OVOP policy was promoted in earnest by creating a special complex. In particular, the 1990s was a period in which restructuring of Korean economic was actively taking place with the opening the, of imports of crops, agricultural crops expanding, and then the reduction of the labor force in rural areas I intensified. The main goal was increase uh, the economic ripple effects uh, through the creation of agriculture and industrial complexes. In the 2000s, the core of the policy was to increase self-sufficiency by strengthening local capacity with the goal of regional innovation. After 2020s, the focus on 2010, uh, the focus is on pluralistic functions of agriculture and rural areas, raising income, creating jobs, and creating virtual, virtual circle structure through the population inflow was the biggest goal of the regional revitalization. In in particular, Korea is making efforts uh, to develop rural specialized industries as a regional job creation platform. Today's webinar is about OVOP, but Korea is discussing at the regional level, not the village level. Through the Rice Paddy project in Namhae, the southern part of Korean peninsula, 
is the number of jobs created uh, 305% from, um, uh, from three, nine, uh, 396 in 2000 to 1,606 in 2015. Yongguang uh, is also the southern part of the Korean Peninsula, employs 1,436 people on increase of 2,295% compared to the 2,000 by making special products and that are dried and salted with the theme of gulbi. It means that the, the, the kind of fish and specially, specialty product. The core of the rural, uh, regional rural convergence industry nurturing policy is to make the, it work by integrating the, it around the hub rather than doing individual businesses at the stage of the value chain, at the every stage of value chain. The target has been expanded from supporting individual business entities to supporting front to back uh, linked businesses. The policy goal has aimed to revitalize the economy and grow together in the rural areas, going beyond increasing the income of individual businesses. For this work, for this to work, the key is the industrialized industrial policies and regional development policies are supported together in an integrated manner rather than support for the each industry individually. When supporting an individual business entity, the certified company is selected and a professional uh, counseling is supported and antenna shop is operated and basic fact finding is supported by government. At the regional level, networks are established for the sixth industrialization that is a linkage between the value chains, diffusions, aggregations, and scale up and a regional level promotion system is established. In addition, integrated support will be provided in connection with the local tourism system. The slide you see now is a representative rural convergence industrial complex designated state status. As you can see, we have designated and nurtured specialized complexes targeting various crops in various regions. The Korean government aims to expand the regional network from 25 uh, locations in 2017 and uh, to, uh, 92 to 2022. A similar situation is likely in your country, but even in rural areas in Korea, businesses, entities in rural areas lack capacity compared to the urban areas. To support this, the Korean government is emphasizing the in establishment of uh, a uh, network. From now on, I would like to introduce you a case of gochujang cluster. It means the fermentative uh, food paste of Korea uh, produced by the, the chili pepper, hot chili pepper. And Suncheonggun, the southern part of the Korean peninsula, um, studied by Cray. Suncheonggun, Suncheong County, located in southern part of Korean peninsula, has long been known as a good area for farming due to its good water and fertile soil. In particular, it has famous for fermentative foods such as red pepper paste, which Korean prefers. Koreans prefer and the government used to make some sauce district in uh, Suncheong County. The table you see now show the government and administrative organizations, 
stakeholders and key players, suppliers, central industries and distribution channels, invest, um, innovators, competitors, and market characteristics, respectively. It is important to build uh, to a network. In the case of Suncheon County, uh, we asked about the type of cooperation in uh, production with uh, local entities. As a result of survey, it was found that the form of co-production of products occupied the largest portion. After that, the, the answer was that they would jointly procure low raw materials like the, the soy, soy sauce or soybeans or hot red chili peppers. Co-promotion and the businesses were found to relatively low compared to the other regions. As a result of survey, it was found that the network density in Suncheon County it was higher than uh, in 2017 compared to 2014 within just uh, three years. The average linkage per business unit also increased. If I uh, picturally show the, the result, it is, uh, this is it. Compared to the three years ago, it can be seen that various uh, stakeholders are cooperating in a complex way. It was found that the roles and cooperatives relations relationships of key stakeholders have become more uh, complex and uh, diversified. The survey explored the, the factors limiting the growth of new rural convergence industry case reasons. First, the uh, decrease of probability is cited as a factor that hindered new production activities. Investments and effort are required to, uh, for new activities, but uh, decrease in profitability, profitability until the period when such capability are accumulated is suggested as a risk factor. So far, we have briefly looked at the case of OVOP in Korea. In Korea in particular, uh, it can be seen that the entry of new farms and formation of networks through the Agriculture Techno Technology Center and Research Society within the, the region are actively appearing. I think this is especially necessary for developing countries. The case of Korea is not a model answer, but all policies should be appropriately modified and applied according to the demographic, cultural, social, economic conditions of each country's rural areas. If there are no incentives for business entities participating in a value chain to cooperate with other business entities to expand their businesses, it will be difficult to expect the effective of policy. In other words, this means that individual business entities should be profitable economically. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, for distinguished uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure all of you would be aware that among the six countries speaking today, uh, the Republic of Korea is indeed the most advanced and therefore the most urbanized and therefore the case for rural convergence is a very important one. And this also has lessons for many of the countries in the region who are moving in that direction of higher incomes, greater urbanization, high, and, and, some of the pro, and some of the issues related to demographic transition, as, and especially in agriculture. So at this point, uh, we move to our, the country, next country, which is India. And we, at this point, we have uh, Dr. C. Anand Ramakrishnan, who is the director of the Indian Institute of Food Processing Technology, which is part of the Ministry of Food Processing and Industries of the Government of India. So he will be giving, so he will be giving a pre-recorded presentation on 
the um, uh, on the one district, one commodity scheme in India. We are also joined by another distinguished guest from India, from the Ministry, the Assistant Commissioner of Crops from the Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Mr. Aga Simani. So you can see him now as well on the panel on the screen. So thank you very much, Mr. Aga Simani, for joining us. Uh, Secretary, please play the video from India. Thank you so much for if you to inviting me to express a view of one district, one product concept implemented in India. And I'm going to present uh, how this has been implemented in the face manner at India. Before going to that, why this concept has been evolved and that's been uh, considered by government of India is India is now produced most of the agri commodities like world number one and two, most of the commodities. You can see that uh, world number one in the diary, fruits and vegetable, world number two, food grinds now reached almost 280 million tons. So that's what continuously production is increased in India. And Indian food processing sector also growing in the double digit growth rate almost last five years. And the total grocery market at India is uh, stands sixth in the world. And 19% of the total workforce is works in the food processing sector. And the size of the industry right now, it is the fifth in the scale, like total production and capacity as well as export. And this continuous growth rate, not only from the larger industry, and it comes from the small and medium and micro industries. And 90% of this total food processing sector is lies with the that MSME sector. And under this sector, the food processing, 25 lakh of food processing enterprises are unorganized. They are not registered. And they mostly it's a family owned organizations. And the investment on the plant and machinery is very, very low. So as like around 7%. And more than 60% of this micro food processing enterprises are at rural area. And second thing, this is the industry has yield a lot of employment in the rural area but they are unable to expand their business into the larger extent. What are the issues or challenges they faced by the micro food processing sector is one of the issues, the access to the modern technologies. They may be age old technologies, they are practicing, they are producing the product, they're sending to the supply chain, but they wanted to upscale or they wanted to adapt newer technology, where to go, how to get that technology, how to increase the efficiency or reduce the wastage. That is the big challenge faced by this micro food processing enterprises. Second one is that capital deficiencies as well as the loan credit. They take most of these units that takes the loan and the repayment and all this issue put a lot of pressure on the system, not able to expand their capacity and lack of awareness and training of mainly for the food safety and control system. They should understand what are the quality parameters as to be maintained good manufacturing practice, how to implement the HSCP systems and branding and marketing. And this is the one area they satisfied with the market, what they are selling at the local market, or maximum district level or the state level. How to penetrate in the whole countries and outside the country? How to market their branding, branding into the international level? This is the one great challenge faced by this micro food processing sector. And how to sort it out, this type of problem faced by the micro food processing enterprises? That's what Government of India launched last year, Prime Minister formalization of micro food processing enterprises scheme. This is the centrally sponsored scheme, budget close to the 10,000 crore for the 2020-24 and selected almost 707 district and with 137 ODOP products. This is a product specific scheme. Each district identified one product. This is identified by the state nodal agencies and state governments. They have the data, how much total production in the particular district and how many existing units, how much raw material available to go for the processing and how much new units can come into that one. Based on that, this 137 ODOPs have been selected. And who are the people are going to get benefited? One is the farmers, producers, organizations, and self-help groups also can be part of this process. And the existing food enterprises, as well as the new entrepreneurs, both can come into that. The existing entrepreneurs, no need to come under the ODOP scheme. 
but new enterprises they have to apply under the odup that selected district suppose they selected one district as the for example coconut they have to apply in the coconut processing units that's what their whole structure has been made and the whole objective was the one is the access to the credit that's what this uh, micro food processing enterprises has been issue on the access to credit this gives easy to access to the banking sector second one is the professional and technical support so we made all the technical institution in the india based on like a csir icr or a ministry of food processing industry institutions we made the network so whatever the technologies available with this institution this industries the micro food processing industry can get it and apart from that we like to strengthen these institutions and one more beauty of this odop concept is the common facilities for example somebody can start the unit with their own money along with the credit support and uh, government support what is given under the pmfme scheme if they don't have the land or space or even at money they can bring the raw material go to the common incubation facilities they can process they can pack and take it so it takes care about the whole spectrum who wanted to do the even business itself and the what is the target number this next four years time we are targeting almost 2 lakh micro food processing enterprises bring into the formalized manner and how the support goes under this scheme is 35% government uh, support the subsidy will be given to the existing as well as the new enterprises existing enterprises want to expand or capacity increasing whatever it is they want to put it 35% support new enterprises as i said earlier it is considered under the one district one product concept apart from that same 35% government support will be given for the farmers producers organizations health self help groups cooperatives as well and one more beauty of this scheme has been support for the marketing and branding they can brand it their product suppose particular region or particular district they wanted to brand that unique uh, brand into the global brand it's possible to do that the branding and marketing support also given to do that that is the what we need to generate more employment not only that other way around that particular brand is created in the particular locality more tourist spots and other people can come to that visit into that place to buy that product so that is the what that branding and marketing also included under the scheme and how that capacity building program has been inbuilt under the scheme because we understand that training program is very much important to implementing such a level of going to village level taluk level because we need to empower the people they have to understand what is the food business and how to do their product and how to market their product that's what that national institution like indian institute of food processing technology where i am there and apart from that our sister institution niftam join hand to develop the total curriculum of the training program and each state master trainers will be trained and this master trainer in turn they train the district level trainers this district level trainer will train the district resource persons this district resource person act between the communicating between the beneficiaries or who are the applicant so this district resource person develop the dps detailed project report and application process handover support everything will be connect between the government system and the beneficiaries so whole spectrum has been covered under the capacity building and these are the component we aim to give the training in our material one is the raw material availability that is the key element including water how much available how much they can use and the pricing initially most of the this type of industry go for the lower pricing and later if the inflation increase they can't able to earn, increase the price the how to fix the pricing and consumer preference this is a key element now earlier for example 100 years back we used to take food for the energy 50 years back we have taken food for the nutritious now people want to take food for soul the people mindset is entirely changing and the market demand is changing day by day so such a scenario will be included and already we included in the some of the curriculums and also technological upgradation and waste utilization for example if you take that rice milling unit 31% wastage is generated in the rice milling on an average so how to utilize even that wastage any industry that small industry what is the waste utilization how to use that waste utilization that has been inbuilt on the curriculum of most of that our subject area what is the master trainers and one 
specifically each and every training has focused on the food packaging this is a not only that food packaging is a simple one because that is the one attracts the people and the labeling they have to be aware of that what are the labeling regulations in india and outside our country so that clearly spelled out they have given the training to the all the beneficiaries and also supply chain management as well as logistic including that so they have to understand how the whole supply chain is takes place including the storage and the logistic and the final end product where it is reaching and the documentation of the whole scenario from the raw material procurement to the end product so these all the things inbuilt on our curriculum apart from the food safety and the regulations because regulations in india fssi is regulating the total food safety and uh, all the regulations for example someone start the business on even coconut processing what are the regulations on that oil processing what are the regulations so all these things inbuilt on the our curriculum and this is the resource material we made it available in open source for example odop wise demonstration videos detailed project report everything we already uploaded like a 138 what i i said that all the detailed reports has been uploaded in our website including like fssi regulations course material and if you go to the our uh, portal we can get all this uh, detailed report and the videos and this is the pmf army capacity building portal of ministry of food processing industry if you click here we will get all this training material and for example fruits and vegetable processing if you go there we have the detailed videos all the fruits and vegetable product selected by the odop in the particular district has been uploaded here for example goa juice and here our point presentation as well as the video for how the processing technologies and in india we have a lot of other local languages we made it the videos in the different languages as well if you click that english so we have the video so that will give entrepreneurs confident on making this type of product so end to end solution has been given in the portal itself for example here how it goes on the processing and each stage the cleaning washing processing and uh, final product is end product whatever it comes this all the demonstration not only that trainers guide you suppose master, master trainer how to give the training to the district level training and how to give the training to the resource person all this component has been inbuilt and it is uploaded in our website and the earlier i said about our incubation center and this is the what common food processing center has been created right now is a 54 center has been created and right now we are giving 100% fund to the government institutions and private institution 50% fund and mentoring institution has to be there in the application itself because some institutions may be have the good expertise on particular field for example banana national resource center for banana has the expertise on that so they have to take such institution as a mentoring institution and operational and maintenance uh, operation o and m also has to be awarded to the third party this is a total business model has been created and based on that this incubation center has been created is a totally based on odop concept already we given this are the areas like a minor forest produce this is like a mostly the tribal products for the mushroom tamarind and honey such type of plants even we wanted to emphasize and we wanted to encourage tribal population can start processing their product in the mainstream level and then fruits and vegetables spice fish and grain oils all these lines has been already approved and still some more processing line we are going to add in every year and our aim is to end hunger and achieve the food security to world it's a possible to achieve either at uh, one village one product or one nation one product or one district one product we need to emphasize the local employment because such type of approach definitely enhance the local employment and local business model so that will enhance the localized food security as well as in the hunger thank you so much for inviting thank you dr uh, anand ramakrishnan for that excellent overview on uh, in india uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen colleagues we can see the real difference here given the size of the country the sheer volumes and the numbers are much higher than what we've discussed so here it's all about scale uh, achieving economies of scale and benefiting the largest number of people possible
So on that note, we just move a little northward to into the Himalayas and we bring in Nepal. And the presentation from Nepal is by Mr. Sunil Kumar Singh, who is the senior agroeconomist of the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development and the Department of Agriculture Planning and Monitoring. So Secretary, please play the video from Nepal. Respected chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, in my presentation, I will be focusing on the status of one village, one product, and the possibility of initiation of one country, one commodity in Nepal. OBOP was implementing nine years in Nepal. Within nine years of execution, the program has been extended in 118 villages of 15 districts with 31 communities. Yeah. Now, uh, so I so how about the background of OBOP in Nepal? Federation of Nepali Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the heads of OBOP, on their on their official visit to Japan and Thailand, and decided to implement the concept of OBOP in Nepal also. They made a core committee to study and discuss the OBOP implementation mechanism with the government of Nepal. And after a rigorous discussion with the government, it was finally launched in 2006 as a public-private partnership as a pilot project for five years. Now, I will move to the details. I have tried to show the year-wise growth of OBOP in the map. So you see, initially we start with five products as a pilot project in eight districts in 2006 and gradually as a three more products in 2007 and likewise we achieved 31 products in the last nine years. Now I'll focus on the implementation mechanism of the project. The project was jointly drawn and monitored by the government of Nepal and the FNCCI. The OBOP had a steering committee comprises of public private um, public private sector core members who decide implementation mechanism areas and products there is a central and technical committee to support and materialize the ideas and scheme of the steering committee at the center which provides support and help to the implementing committees at the district level now I'll focus on budget allocation for OBO. The total allocated budget for OVOP from fiscal year 2006-07 to fiscal year 2014-15 by the government was 3,303 million, but only 74% of the total budget was spent during the project implementation period. Why the allocated budget didn't apply efficiently? It was only because of delay in the decision making and tightness created by the committees are the main reason for not utilizing the full allocated budget. The norms and approach on few aspects are also not enough to implement the program smoothly. Now we'll move to the data for representing the beneficiaries of the project. The OBOP had been extended in 118 villages of 54 districts with 31 commodities and a total of a total of total of 233 farmers group are directly benefited with the program with 5,680 farmers involved in which women farmers participation was about 35 percent. The average annual sales value of OVOP commodities was about 133 million per year. Next. I will now present you uh, a case study of successful farmer who is benefited the most of the most from this OVOP program, Daman Lama success case. Daman Lama is an ordinary farmer from a hilly district, Nuagot. He is an energetic fellow looking for opportunities of his survival in hilly village of Nepal. He started his proud farming 
with a very limited resources of 1.2 million Nepalese currency in 2006, Daman and his family, including his neighbor, had got a lot of opportunity to have training and visit organized by the OVOP. He happened to grab an opportunity of an observational visit to Japan with the members of FNCCI in 2000, where he was impressed by the methods and techniques of crowd farming. He implemented the methods and techniques he learned during the visit in his crowd farming and grew his business worth 35 million in just 15 years of time. Now I will turn now I will move now, now I, I will move to the elements responsible for the success of the OVOP in Nepal. The key elements for the success are number one, most of the commodity commodities selected in pilot program were indigenous and have high potential for expansion. Number two, all selected commodities have a remarkable demand in both national and international market. It has a great potential to provide employment to the poor and marginal groups. Number three, OVA has supported to the national priority commodities. The budget allocation was focused on focused to enable the basic services and core function only. Basis, the marketing part was basically allocated to the private sector. The reason behind this was to utilize their two basic strengths that is efficiency and flexibility in flexibility in uh, operation. Number six, the district level OVOP committee provided subsidy to the priority activities and commodities only. So these above are the success element of the OVOP in Nepal. Let's move to lesson we learned from this program. I have taught that. The public-private partnership policy is a basic requirement for OVOP success. The objective of program was to promote OVOP products in national and international markets with brand. However, it could not happen. However, it not could happen because their capacity and technical map part could not work as envisioned in the program. The OVOP don't converse very well as diverse area and products include were many in numbers. The institution responsible for the implementation and management could not function effectively. This is one of the weakness of OVOP to realize its objective. Decision making process was also lengthy. Other lesson learned new product and area were included in OVOP before the outcome at evaluation of product included in pilot project, which was the which was against the implementation concept and guideline approved by the government of Nepal. As per new constitution of Nepal 2015, the role of agriculture service delivery devolved to local government. Therefore, the implementation of OVOP came under responsibility of the local government and Ultimately, it was terminated due to transition period. Political and bureaucratic interference and dependencies solely on government budget was another reason for termination of the OVA program in Nepal. Let's talk about future challenges of this program. There are some weakness held in the program. Number one, private sectors are profit-oriented organizations so their responsibility should be clear. The production should be based on market demand, otherwise the product will not optimum price. Number three weakness was product for export should maintain a standard and norms of importing country for food safety. Number four, there are chances of replacement of a small farmer who have less capacity to compete in the open market system. Based on, based on our lesson learned and experience gained on OVOP products in Nepal, we will recommend the initiation of one country, one commodity in Nepal. It will be, it will help in generating employment for a small farmers and it is good for, good approach for commercial agriculture. 
the following indicators while selecting uh, the product for one country, one commodity. Number one, the product should be identified having local essence. Number two, to utilize and immobilize skill, skill of local people. The selection of product should be based on potential of for commercial production. Training and training on enterprise development and entrepreneurship should be provided by value addition throughout the value chain and benefit women and small farmers. Market linkage development, potentiality of employment generation. So on the basis of above lesson learned, ginger could be priority commodity for uh, one country, one commodity in, in Nepal. So why ginger are important for one country, one commodity in Nepal? Uh, ginger is a high value crop in Nepal. It is estimated that 1.2 million people uh, grow ginger all over the uh, all over the Nepal, especially in eastern and western part of Nepal. Nepal is fourth largest producer of fresh ginger in the world, of which the largest part of is for the domestic market and all exported ginger is designated mainly for India. Ginger farmers in Nepal lack awareness about ginger processing technology and marketing of the products. On the basis of above strength and weakness, being a priority exportable product, we need to include ginger under one country, one commodity. Key challenges that the one country, one commodity programs need to be addressed uh, number one, there could be labor shortage. The production should be based on market demand, otherwise product will not get optimum price. Production and marketing costs should be min minimized to maintain food safety standard as per more important country requ uh, requirement. Agriculture products are highly perishable in nature, so should focus on storage, processing, branding and marketing of the products. There is a Tons of replacement of small farmers who have less capacity to compete in the open market system. So, if Nepal participate in one country, one, uh, one comedy initiative, we wish to achieve, especially, specifically, the operational as well as institutional and policy support on promoting one country, one commodity, which will ulti ultimately support on rural development, food security and strengthening governance and institutional capacity. Number one, geography selection, product identification and institutional mapping, knowledge and skill, technology support in policy formulation, market promotion, online marketing and connectivity, agriculture finance. Investment in agriculture are the best weapon against hunger and poverty. They have made life better for billions of people that's the end of my presentation thank you thank you mr singh uh, and uh, excellency colleagues uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, as you saw some we missed some of the earlier parts of the presentation there were technical difficulties while we were recording uh, let's not forget nepal is in lockdown and uh, Mr. Singh had difficulties even to access his own office or to access the FAO office, which would have been the way we would have uh, done it otherwise. So I really like to thank Mr. Singh and the technical team for persisting and getting this recording done. It was not easy. However, we will be sharing all the presentations with the permission of the speakers, and you will have all the opportunity to go through them in greater detail. That said, thank you, Mr. Singh, again, and for especially highlighting some of the challenges in the country and, the, the, and also your expectations from the OCOC program to FAO, and that's important guidance for us. Uh, the next presentation will be from Thailand, which is the country where we are hosted in, and that, pre that presentation will be by Mrs. Jantima Jones, Foreign Relations Officer of the Planning Division, Community Development Department, Ministry of the Interior, Thailand. Secretary, please play the Thailand video. Today, I would like to share the project's core one component product or top 
the experience from Thailand. Let's start with the story of Otop and how to implement in Thailand. As everyone know, the idea of Otop was start in Japan many years ago. And this idea came to Thailand in 2001. It was introduced to Thai people by Thai government. Tambon is the Thai word, and it stands for a village. We choose Tambon to start the program because of Tambon's smaller administrative, but and big enough to run this program. We have three principles of all talk. The first one is local rich global. The second one is self-reliant and creativity. The last one is human resource development. Every activity of OTOP are based on these three principles. The objective of OTOP is to create a job and increase community income. The second one is promote local wisdom. The third one is strengthen community. The fourth one is promote human resource development. And the last one is promote community activity. To be a member of OTOP producer, you need to register. There are three types of producer that can be registered as OTOP producer. The first one is community-based occupation proof. The second one is individuals. The last one is community-based SME. The number of producers in Thailand up to now is 93,414 producers. A total of products that have been approved in 2001 are 93,414 registered. And we have some OTOP group that haven't been approved yet, about five or 600 this year. Category of OTOP product. We have five category of OTOP products, uh, which is the first one is food, the second one is beverage, the third one is textile dressing wear, the next one is furniture, decoration, and souvenir. The last one is herbal product. From the beginning up to now, we have more than 200,000 products to register as the OTOP number. We are creating all the products by using the specific criteria to determine the products for grading from one star to five star. The five star is a good quality and potential to export. Four star is a potential and able to develop internationally. Three star is a medium quality. Two star is the product that can be developed to three star. One star is a product that cannot be developed, but we still keep one star to be as a group because someday they might be developed to a two star or three star. So value chains of the OTA product. This is uh, the world chains from downstream to upstream. We start from downstream to promote the local wisdom. Mainstream is to capacity building of producer and entrepreneur and auto product development and marketing promotions. Upstream is to set up the development of new auto group and to to register as an OTOP member and to selection and grading like OTOP star. As we talked before, all of these, the objective is to promote the grassroots economy through local wisdom. We create our activity to develop the member of OTOP, such as OTOP registration, knowledge based OTOP, OTOP production champion, conservation of lo local wisdom, 
entrepreneur chief development young or top or top tourist village and we set up the auto fair or auto distribution and exhibition center also for the auto project in thailand not only community development department responsibility to this project but we have the government agencies more than 22 agencies from 10 ministry to be involved with this project such as ministry of interior ministry of culture ministry of agriculture and cooperation ministry of public health ministry of labor ministry of tourism and sport ministry of industry ministry of commerce ministry of finance Ministry of Technology and Science and the Public Enterprise. This is structure of administrative of OTOP project. It starts from National OTOP Board, Administrative Subcommittee, Pro Productions Promotion Subcommittee, Marketing Promotion Submittee, Standard and Product Development Subcommittee, Regional OTOP Subcommittee, Provincial OTOP Subcommittee, District OTOP Subcommittee, and the Bangkok. And the last one is Bangkok Metropolis Standard Subcommittee. In this subcommittee, have a basic functions like implement and coordinate, promote and support on relating it to the monitoring and evaluation, appoint advisor additional secretary, set up additional subcommittee. And this is timeline of the OTOP project since 2001 up to now. The first one when OTOP come to Thailand via a range of administrative mechanisms. The second year, we are searching the product, searching the people who work with the, this product, uh, both individual and for a group. The, the, year, the, next, the year after, we are uh, set up the activity that we call OTOP Product Champion to find which product that can be uh, developed. And the, after that, we try to find the standard of product to make is to make is like uh, to have more quality for sales. And the years after, we do the marketing because we produce a lot of product and we need to sell. And the years after, we search of the provincial star or top. So we try to get them to do the. Um, the best, uh, the best product in, in the province. And then in 2007, we do the OTOP select and we try to do the, um, we try to select the best OTOP products in, in that province. And the next one, the product development. So we develop all the product that can be developed in every province. And after that, we add in marketing. And then we do the product development again and do the marketing again. Until 2013, we try to get the new way to develop the products. And up to now, we try to get the OTOP to sell in another country. This is the volume in each year and a convert from Thai baht into the dollar. We can see the number of the income is increasing every year. So it's only some year that's dropped down because, because of the uh, crisis in the country. And from last year to this year, the number of income is going down because of the COVID pandemic. This slide, just to show you in the club for Thai, for all top products. 
income. The success factor of all top project. The first one is uh, accepting social, existing social capital group and local wisdom. The second one is government's committee national agenda. So the Thai government sets the auto projects as the national agenda. That's why people in the in in Thailand focus on this project, make it successful. The next one is agency integration effectiveness. As I talked before, not only my organization that do this project. Every government organization have different function to take care of this project too. The next one is people in the community particip participation. And everyone knows these projects can help them to have more income. The next one is focus policy on class loss economy and sufficient and competent government field officer, knowledge based development of product. And the last one is total plan. In Thailand, we have like if if we walk to the uh, exhibition, some exhibition, they have they have a lot of product. But if we say it's like this is the old top product, people more interesting to this that product than then another plan. In 2017, we have changed in the OTOP project. OTOP, we add more some activity on the OTOP projects, like the OTOP trader supply chain development by the senior, junior corporation. So at the beginning, we community development department just work on the OTOP products in the English. And then we add more education, educational institutes, and then we have the Pachara Raksamaki to, to work together. And in the middle past, so we connect us and linkage with the other organizations like OTOP. We set up the OTOP trader, we is established in 38 provinces, and we have OTOP distribution center. We have the data center and learning center, creative and design center. And we have the product and packaging center. And right now we are facilitate facilitates local distributions to we have a shop in in every country, the old hop shops. We have the modern trade, we have department store and we have international export. And we add more marketing channels such as even we set up a lot of even in every year. So like people in Thailand know we have the auto fair to sell all the auto products from every province in one area. We have auto trainer, we have auto mini mart. Thai Chui Thai market is mean Thai Kyo Thai market. And we have all top to the town in in the in the town in Bangkok. We have the top shop in the shopping mall. We have all top lifestyle. We have a salad, soup, Thai all top shop, and we have all top to border twenty times per year. Like we set up the event to sell the all top product in the neighbor country. For example, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. And we have the modern trades also. One of activity that Thailand do with the auto products is to bring the products from the village to, to the airplanes we call auto on board. And this, pro, this activity make the auto price go up and lots of people interesting with the Thai products and they make more income for the community. 
the one of activity that we set up with the auto product is tourist integration. Like before, we bring all the products to the town to sell. But right now, we try to get the cus customer to, to, to go to the window to see the way of life, to see the way that we make the products. So they can confidence with what we make, what we put in the products to show them the Thai culture. And this is our activity that we have in 2000s, from the beginning to up to now. And we still have more, more activities is coming up. That's our activity that we do with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jones for bringing us the view from Thailand and for walking us through the rapid progress made from its inception in 2001 and the changes that you've seen in the last few years. Of course, definitely it has been impacted as tourism has been due to the pandemic, but definitely this is another way that it will take off once tourism resumes later on in this year or next year. So we hope to see that. Uh, while we all, before we move on to the last presentation, just to remind all our esteemed panelists that there are a number of questions in the Q&A. You're all free to answer them online by typing in the answer or in the chat. Many, you can, and many of them are addressed to multiple people, so you could do them as you wish. So please do answer and uh, provide uh, your wisdom to all of us in FAO who are developing this program. So we'll now move on to the final presentation, pre-recorded presentation, and this is from Vietnam. And this is by Mr. Nguyen Min Tien, Director General and the Chief of National Coordination Office of the National Target Program on New Rural Development of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of the Government of Vietnam. So Secretariat, please play the video. So as uh, being requested and uh, by the FAO, uh, it's my great pleasure today to give a presentation about the Vietnam One Commute, One Product Program. The content of my presentation is really four parts. The first is the introduction of Vietnam OCOP program. The second is the reroute of OCOP program in Vietnam over the last couple of years. The third is a lesson and future challenge. And the fourth is a proposal of Vietnam. Third is an introduction of Vietnam OCOP program. The OCOP program of Vietnam is based on the experience of Japan one village, one product, or it called it OBLP, and also the Thailand OTOP program. And other country experiences. Since 2013, some provinces of Vietnam has implemented the one commune, one product program with some positive outcome, contribute to rural development and improving the living standard in rural areas. With that experience, in 2018, the government of Vietnam decided to implement the OCOP program for the period of 2018 and 2020 nationwide. So we scan it up from the experience from some provinces to the nationwide. These are the some characteristics of the OCOP program of Vietnam. The OCOP program of Vietnam focus on the development of the local specialized product at village and commune level with the main objective. The first objective is to increase the rural income and create more jobs locally. Second is to promote human resources. And very important is to preservation of diversified culture. We consider the OCOP program is a rural economic development program, the word promoting internal resources, which include the rural wisdom, creativity, labor, raw material, and local culture, etc., to increase added value for rural 
specialized product and contribute to new rural development program of Vietnam. The targeted or co-producer are small and medium enterprises, cooperative and households. The Vietnam Oco product including six product groups. The first is a food. The second group is a beverage. The next one is a urban product. Next is a textile and dressing wear. The fifth group is a decoration and handicraft. And the sixth, the last one is a community-based tourism. So you could see that the six product group including some physical product, but also includes a community-based tourism. The purpose of Vietnam OCOP program, the program of OCOP of Vietnam try to increase OCOP producer to fully utilize the potential of land, product, and other competitive advantage to raise the product value, increase income, and contribute to improve living standard in rural areas. We also try to reorganize the production system to the whole value chain approach with close linkage to draw material production areas. We also increase apply higher quality standard for local specialized products to the new and modern technology. And also the OCOP program Vietnam to promote the startup and creativity in rural areas. So the OCOP program in Vietnam that's being implemented over the last three years. So we have some initial result achievement of the program in Vietnam. The OCOP program in Vietnam has been implemented in all over 63 provinces of Vietnam and that's becoming a priority solution to rural economic development. At the moment, we have 4,847 OCOP products have been erected by government agency to achieve three star and higher, like a four or five star among which food products account for more than 80% and handicraft products account for 10%, other with that 10%. So you see Vietnam have a sick product group, then food products account for more than 80%. At the moment, 2,655 orca producer, of which poverty and small and medium enterprises account for 65.5 percent so 37.5 so percent of our crop producers are cooperative 27 percent 6 percent were sme and remaining including cooperative group and household at the moment more than two-thirds of existing our crop producers have achieved a higher sales revenue with every increase of 17.6% per year. So it's very, very positive outcome from the OCOP program over the last three years. The OCOP program has also contributed to job creation, especially we are very delighted to say that enhancing the role of women and ethnic minority, around 39% of the OCOP register owner are women. About 35% of all crop products are from the ethnic minority area. So these are very special numbers. In over the last three years, from 2018 to 2020 periods, the Vietnam has mobilized nearly 1 billion Vietnam do uh, US do dollar to implement the all crop program, of which the government budget accounts for very small part of only 2.7%. The credit contribute to 76.6% and investment capital of the OCOP producer account for 16.5%. So you could see that the mobilization of resources mostly coming from the credit sources and the investment of the OCOP producer. And over the last three years, 
we mobilize more than 1 billion US dollars to invest in the OCOP program. So with only three years of implementation, we also draw some lessons learned from the Vietnam experiences. The first the Vietnam OCOP target a ability and communal level specialized for small and medium enterprise and also cooperative to promote the development of unique and specialized products. The program is implemented nationwide with the involvement of all four levels of the government, the central government, the provincial government, the district government, and the commune uh, government to getting a spin-off effect in the community, promote the local spirit, the responsibility, and increase the capacity of our co producer combined with local advantages like a local wisdom, community spirit, and diversify culture. So you could see that for the OCOP program in Vietnam, we involve on the four level of the government to the implementation. The program focus on improving the product quality and market accessibility in order to meet the consumer demand for unique traditional quality product, and also to make it more accessibility with first, the OCOP program of Vietnam focused on the 100 million population domestic market. But later on, with improved quality, we expand to the international market. The OCOP of Vietnam also developed OCOP product along with the culture dissemination, utilize the internal value and advantage to promote and introduce the local, regional, and national culture. With some of the lessons learned, we are also facing uh, some challenge to go ahead. The first challenge is how to strengthen the innovation, creation capacity, product development, especially to develop a new product and how to improve the quality of product further. One of that is how to make a locally specialized product to meet the demand and taste of the modern consumer. The second challenge is how to support our co producer to such program like Green OCOP, Fair Trade, with special focus on mountainous, remote, and ethnic minority in order to have the small scale OCOP product to be able to compete with the large scale mass production. You could see that the experience of Vietnam, we focus on small scale production, a specialized product. But how it compete, especially in terms of price, in terms of cost, with a large scale mass production. The next challenge is how to promote Vietnam OCOP to become an international recognized brand and to help to achieve sustainable development. Looking for the future. So at the moment, we have finished the first phase of the OCOP program in Vietnam from 2018 to 2020. And now we are preparing for the next phase, five year 21 to 2025. Based on the previous successful approach, the new OCOP program for the next five year, 2021 to 2025, will unexpectedly add some new direction as following. The first is a develop a standard for and foster the green or core product towards a circular economy and export market, like I just mentioned, how it contributes to sustainable development of the local area. So we will looking to create more green or core product towards a circular economy. The next one is to apply digital transformation to promoting small and medium production to increase the processing and marketing of our core product toward a higher quality and more value added product in the market. So you see that the digital transformation now become very important that we have to help the core producer to apply the digital transformation to the whole chain process of the making and marketing the OCOP uh, product. We also want to uh, expand and we also want to introduce the Vietnamese diversified culture. So with the, that 
challenge and lesson learned for Vietnam. Today, we are very pleased to be able to be invited and talk about Vietnam experience. And also with the heart of the initiative for FAO for a, a green ARCOP in the future. So with that, we make some proposal. You know that Vietnam has already proposed the initiative of promoting the network for ASEAN rural product development on the one village, one product model, which was approved by AMAP in 2020. Based on that, we would like to ask FAO to support and work with ASEAN countries, including Vietnam, to implement the initiative of promoting the network for ASEAN rural product development based on the one village, one product model. In that, in addition, we would like to ask FAO will chair Go chair and promote the annual ARCOP product development forum in order to exchange and share experiences among countries. We know that around the world, many countries have also experimented or implemented the OTOP or OVOP model. So we would like the FAO will continue to chair, go chair, and promote the annual ARCOP product development forum. The second, regarding the initiative of the Green OCOP development, as I mentioned previously in my presentation, Vietnam already had the direction to uh, go ahead with the Green OCOP development. That's why we also asked for, would like to see FAO will chair, co-chair, and coordinate with other countries, including Vietnam, to research and develop the international Green OCOP criteria which is widely recognized by country in production and trade. And we also would like to propose FAO to accompany and support resources and techniques for country, including Vietnam, to experiment and organize green OCOP development, from which we can draw lessons and expand further in other country and region. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Tien. And uh, that concludes all the video presentations. So esteemed speakers, Excellency, thank you all very much. May I request everybody to switch on their videos as we move to the discussion, discussion section of this webinar. What we will do uh, in the interest of time and, to, and which we have done very well so far, so thanks to all of you, is that I will uh, first ask a question to all our six uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, and then also, I would like to bring in our uh, guest from India, from the Minister of Agriculture, into the conversation. After which, uh, time permitting, we might have another question. And then I will hand it over to the, uh, to the head of our office, to the Assistant Director General, Mr. Kim, for him and the senior management of FAO from Rome to comment and to give us their views, especially on some of the ideas that have been proposed as we heard from Vietnam. So uh, can, can all the panelists please switch on their videos so that we can see you? Um, Cambodia, Korea, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam, please switch on your videos if you can. If you have problems with bandwidth, just let us know. Okay, so the first due question- to, uh, Due to the, the host stopped the, the video, I cannot access the video. Yeah, okay, me, too, me too, me too. They, they up my meeting. Please unlock. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Secretariat, please take the necessary actions to do that. Okay. So the question to all of you, um, Palin, is as you have discussed and given us a broad view on what the your homegrown initiatives in this area, what do you see as the key bottlenecks to further progress? Along is it along production, processing, up to marketing, or anything beyond that? So, what do you see as the key bottlenecks? And we would appreciate if you could keep your answer to about two minutes so that we can go through everyone. So, we'll go in the same order as the speakers. So, Cambodia first. Uh, Excellency, over to you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I cannot I cannot speak on my video. The secretariat is not yet <clears throat> open for me. So, let I try to answer your question. I think that from Cambodian, okay, you can do now, okay. So from Cambodian perspective, uh, I think that 
in order uh, what, uh, the the bottom niche from the production processing to the marketing of OVOP product in Cambodia, we found some of the lack of information matching between the <coughs> provider, purchaser, and consumer. Also, logistics supply is one of the <coughs> bottom niche for us. Uh, the third one is the capacity development that including the technology and technical skill to the local farmer and producer. And the last one of the bottom line is the facilitation financial access both uh, government and private sector. So this is the bottom line of the OVOP content in Cambodia. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, Dr. Lee from Korea. Thank you for the question. Two questions are not separate, I think. The, I can give uh, one answer. First, in both Korea and other developing countries, it is quite difficult for small farmers to be directly engaged into the value chain in which a large enterprise participate. Otherwise, they may become contract farmers of large corporations and exploit their wages. Therefore, in Korea, scaling up these small farmers into organizations such as uh, crop groups or the agricultural cooperatives has been highest priority support goal. When these crop uh, groups or cooperatives gain experiences and grow to certain size, they set up the separate illegal entities and do their own business. In this process, it is the role of the government to provide a low interest rates and help them be become self-reliant through various support activities. In, in addition, these cooperatives are trying to lower prices by continuously developing products that urban consumers want, uh, producing agricultural products that meet their needs, opening stores uh, di in, uh, directly in the city, or reducing the level of supply by delivering directly to retailers has been, uh, it, it, these kind of activities are uh, through the common uh, sense of uh, thinking uh, between uh, uh, producers and the urban consumers. In this uh, process had to be accompanied by mature consumer awareness. Consumers wanted to consume in a way that has was produced environmentally and then farmers were protected. In other words, uh, this is a, a market-driven structure. The government minimized the intervention in this process, but on the other hand, effort to help under capable SME and small farmers continue. For example, the, the providing con consulting continuously or the operating an antenna shop to wait until farmers develop uh, operational skills. It will be uh, a kind of incubation activities, I think. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, next, same question now to Nepal, Dr. Singh. The bottleneck stress, stress in the implementation of one village, one product program in Nepal are from production point of view, the fragmented land, the poor technical extension services, lack of access to suitable germ plasm, production technique constraints and lack of access to production credit, policy affecting the production and its deployment are the bottlenecks faced in production. And, and regarding process point of view, lack of skills, equipment, technology, investments, poor grading and packaging, branding are the other bottlenecks in process. Uh, non in investment of agriculture-based diversified food industry is another bottleneck in process industry. Now from marketing point of view, product marketing and distribution problems are there. Poor marketing and infrastructure 
are there. Products being perishable and degradable in nature, there is a high cost of transportation. These are the bottlenecks faced in the marketing section. That's that's over, sir. Thank you, Mr. Singh. That was very useful. So, can I pass the question to Dr. Anand Ramakrishnan from India? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. For me, this is the main bottleneck if you look at access to the international market because it's a local brand and some question post on the chart backs also they are talking about how to accommodate with the bigger brands with the local brand. And if you look at the recent studies in the FR foot uh, published, uh, very clearly demonstrated more than 30% increased in the local product in the local market. Anyhow, most of the local market access the, uh, accept the local brands, no issue on that. But how to market this local product into the international market? That is the big challenge and how other countries needed the packaging, the safety protocols. It should be followed in the when the manufacturing itself. That is the one we need to train the local producers and the local manufacturer according to the other countries need and safety protocols. That is the big uh, bottleneck and then access to the technological input. For example, reduce the wastage, how to reduce the wastage and how to increase the uh, production level or efficiency and how to reduce the carbon footprint when we do the things. All these things has to be inbuilt on our capacity building and training. That's what that whole stuff is come under the capacity building and training. The whole model should be outcome oriented training. It's not like us just we give the information to the entrepreneurs. We need to make sure they get the training and they implemented in the field and time to time we need to track how it is a yielded result in the field and we need to track each training module is it how effective and how it is the yielded result either the marketing strategy or the technology side and what is that total outcome we achieved the total target is supposed 2 million entrepreneurs we wanted to train in this many years and 2 million out of that how many is succeed how many failures so this is the one bottleneck we need to track throughout the country then it is possible to implement a further next year. Yes, these are the one we need to drop and these are the one we need to go further up. So this is the main bottleneck to track and capacity building and the capacity building has to include both the component of marketing and technology. Thank you, Professor. So indeed, tracking and prioritization as we go forward. So that's a very good comment. So can we now ask, bring in Thailand? Um, what, what do you, you have a lot of experience now. So what do you see as the key bottleneck in this area? You, I'm on, please unmute yourself. Sorry, I, can you hear me all right? Okay, because I have a problem to plug in the microphone, so I'm gonna speak out. If it's not clear enough, just let me know. For Thailand, like the line of production is not consistent, the first one. The lines of production is not like, it's not, not always the good quality or the, they have enough um, amount of product that we need. The second one is we have lots of opportunity to access the capital. And then we have like uh, not enough investment sometimes. And sometimes we have the problem with the uh, export products. And as you know, we bring to these projects for long, like 19 years, 20 years, and we face a lot of problems that we have, but most of the problem that we are um, have up to now, after we pass all the problem is how to transfer our local wisdom from own generations to the next generations also. This is the Thailand experience and Thailand based the problem. Thank you, that's great advice, uh, Mr. Jones. So uh, Vietnam, what do you have to say on this? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the case of Vietnam, I think at least we have a two uh, uh, bottom leg. The first one is in terms of uh, the market access. Uh, like I, I uh, previous mentioned in my presentation, uh, because uh, the OCOP produce, uh, produce product in Vietnam is a small scale production. Uh, and so it's very difficult for a uh, small producer to engage in the distribution channel, especially to the end consumer in the big city. 
uh, big market or even more the overseas market and how uh, a small uh, scale or crop uh, product can be able to compete uh, in terms of price, in terms of uh, distribution channel, in terms of marketing with a big scale production and how the consumer can be able to differentiate uh, between the old crop specialized product with a normal mass, uh, mass production product. So th that's a problem because uh, um, uh, most of our uh, old crop producer are small scale are people in the mountainous um, area in the marginal ethnic, ethnic. So I think it's uh, very difficult for them for, to, in, in, to, to engage um, equally with a, a big crop uh, producer. Uh, the second bottleneck in terms of uh, the capacity and technique uh, of the uh, storage and uh, the processing, uh, especially uh, the, this bottleneck is the further uh, exposed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, and for the uh, highly seasonal um, uh, uh, product. So uh, we lack the uh, cold storage. So during the seasonal big product, it's very difficult for uh, the, the producer to keep uh, the raw material and also they lack the uh, enough adequate capacity in order to possess um, their product. So I think uh, in the case of Vietnam, because we have uh, only implemented the OCOP program for the last three years from the 2018-2020. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, several uh, bottom-up, but I think the main uh, bottleneck remain in the uh, marketing and market access. And the second one is in uh, the technology and capacity of the cold storage and the processing uh, system. Thank you. Thank you, Vietnam. So that's interesting to learn uh, also from a country that has rapidly made advances in the last few years and succeeded even mobilizing a lot of resources. So having heard this, so I'd like to bring in our uh, special guest from India, from the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Somnath Agasimani. Uh, from the point of view of the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, sir, what do you think is the role that can be played to increase this one district, one commodity program that you've got? Over to you, sir. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like uh, side by side, along with the uh, Ministry of Food Processing Industries, the Ministry of Agriculture, in consultation with the MOFP, and uh, the most of the products that uh, we selected were from horticulture side. These, most of the horticulture producers, as you know, they are uh, not, uh, the self life of these products are very low. For example, if you take in case of capsicum and uh, tomato, uh, they are, the wastage of uh, these products is usually high and, and during the time uh, gone to higher levels. So uh, like as uh, Sir was talking fr uh, from our uh, country, uh, the processing comes in as a major this one for uh, this one, Sir. And the sensitization of the farmers and also the entrepreneurs is a need of the hour. And uh, as Sir rightly quoted, the capacity building is a must. And uh, uh, also there need to be a uh, well backward and forward linkage. And also the ministry is working on the creation of farmer producer organizations and uh, where in the marketing division it, it is uh, taking a lead role in creation of around we are, we are planning to create about 10,000 uh, farmer producer organizations and uh, hence uh, uh, this it, it's an, a very good uh, program and a scheme. I mean. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Was talking forestry products like in india we we are uh, uh, we are selected crops like mahua mahua that is having an uh, very good medicinal properties and apart from that uh, from wild like the uh, jamun then the other crops like uh, amla they are having good medicinal properties and they are being uh, this one uh, giving importance 
Thank you, Mr. Lagasimini, for giving us that view and the importance of medicinal and aromatic plants also in this mix. So, um, Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so what we will do, we have just about five or six minutes, and then I would like uh, the uh, I'd like the ADG then to take us to the end of this program. So we will just now have one short question, and we hope that you can answer it within a minute. And and I'm sorry to put you on the spot on this, but can you please advise FAO? What would be your advice to FAO on how to take forward this initiative? given your own knowledge and expertise and, uh, and about the region in particular. So again, we start uh, Excellency from Cambodia. What would be your advice? <laughs> Thank you for that question. I think that uh, for my suggestion that uh, FAO should be uh, doing the OCOC based on the existing country contact that uh, we learned from them in the past. And the pilot project is more important that we see uh, how the OCOC can be operated in the country uh, context. So another one is uh, FIOs need to be uh, re review the legal framework that each country has doing about OVOP. So it can be uh, consistent uh, what existing OVOP approach in the country level and can be, uh, can be consistent with the OCOC approach that is initiated by the FAO. So that is my uh, suggestion to FAO. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. As useful as always, coming from your experience. Uh, same, uh, Dr. Lee from Korea. Yes, I I absolutely agree with the, the Cambodian rep, uh, presents the opinion. Uh, firstly, we uh, have we should have the the investigate the cultural context for each uh, each countries. Uh, and then the, the find out the best example of OB of OP cases. And then the, the induced the, the common, the project goals and then the inputs and outputs for the, the integrated manner. So um, firstly, as a FAO's uh, stance, I would like to suggest the, the investigation first and then the pilot project uh, should be followed. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Investigation first and pilot. That's a very good suggestion. Uh, Professor Anuramakrishnan, what would you suggest here? Yeah, my suggestion would be we know that what is coming to our plate, one third of the raw material is transported more than 1,000 kilometers in India and most of the world. That is the average statistics if you take. So this is the point if you have to take it as the moment of this one district, one village or one district, one product in the mass level, then we can reduce even the carbon footprint, the transport cost, everything can be reduced, the local employment can be generated and we can increase like a productivity and farmers will get benefited, whatever the objective of UN can be achieved. This is the model, successful model, we can take it and we can implement the mass level and other countries who are not started the implementation, we can give our experience. So we need to make a one common platform like a website created by the FAO, all our uh, like Indian website can be linked, all the countries website can be linked, the single portal. So all the farmers can experience sharing what their successful model, even they want some support from other countries. Some other countries wanted some technological support, what we have the experience because we have already uploaded most of the technologies in our website. That technologies can be useful for other countries. Other countries, same thing, they would have been uploaded some of the technologies model that can be useful for other countries. So common platform, can be created after this one that will be helpful for each other countries and newer countries, other countries not started it. They can also thinking about putting such type of program in their countries. That is the way we can take forward. Thank you, Professor Anuram Krishnan. So the idea of a platform for knowledge sharing and experiences, that's always something that FAO would like to do. Uh, so Nepal, what would be your suggestion? Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we would like to request the FAO to lay a general norms, uh, general norms and standard for food safety for common South Asia, uh, South Asia country, which will facilitate the export of products because we regularly face the problem for the importing country regarding the norms 
by uh, importing norms. So mm -hmm. this is a very burning issue between Nepal and India. Thank you for the suggestion, Nepal, indeed. So uh, the international standard and certification schemes for OCOC. So uh, again, a very good suggestion. Uh, from Thailand, Thailand, what would you be your uh, suggestion? Yes, for Thailand, we uh, suggestions that uh, new products that can, can, I think it's the same idea with India, so I like the idea to exchange the knowledge and new technologies to each country uh, to go together. But in the beginning, I think to focus on the quality more than the, to focus on the quality more than quantity for the each product because we don't know which, which country can produce a good products or not. That is the, to maybe to, to help them a bit. And uh, for the first few years, uh, we're gonna launch this OC, OC, And I think keep doing this, encourage people to, to get more attention, to get more, um, participations and collaborations. Keep doing the training before we get we get together and make a big volume of the products together. Thank you. Thank you, Thailand. So quality over quantity, starting with a few and always a good strategy for such a program. Yeah. Uh, and last but not the least, Vietnam, what would be your suggestion? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, in the case of Vietnam, I think that we do have uh, some uh, a suggestion. First of all, I agree with uh, many previously speaker talking about uh, creating a, a share a dialogue. Uh, FAO can work with um, uh, country to create a dialogue where we can uh, share experiences. Um, uh, we can learn from bad practice around. So I think like uh, uh, the speaker from uh, the panelist from the India that we can put um, uh, own information on the internet in order for uh, member countries we can learn we can draw we can access to that kind of information uh, from uh, experience from other country but also the bad practice around the war uh, the second thing the uh, when we uh, talk about the uh, presentation from Swanli, I think that when ABO um, uh, would like to have initiative for the green ORCOP, so I think the ABO can provide um, uh, the technology and also guideline on uh, several apart from the what is a green production, how we can create a green production, and then to green storage, green processing, and green market access. So I think uh, with the kind of green development. Uh, for us, we also have a direction to go uh, all call for green, but we don't have, and we lack the access to the information and the guideline, but also the experience uh, from MAO expertise and around uh, the world about the production, the processing, the storage, um, the marketing, uh, how it make greens. And in order for that, we can have uh, like a special uh, labor for the kind of uh, special uh, product going greens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tian. And at this point, I just like to like thank all the speakers for their wonderful replies and for able that we were able to keep, uh, keep ourselves on time. Mm -hmm. And now I'll, I'll request the um, the head of our office, the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative, Mr. Kim, to take us through to the end. Over to you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Sarita. Uh, first, let me thank you very much to all the presenters and all the uh, participants uh, in discussing uh, very relevant questions and the comments in chat for Q&A. Indeed, this is an excellent set of presentations and the discussions by distinguished uh, speakers, particularly from Cambodia, India, Republic Korea, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. I do appreciate uh, their contribution to share with us very rich array of experiences, good practices, pilots, lessons learned, and the challenges, and the very relevant recommendation to FAU. 
I, have, I highly appreciate all of this. Uh, let me uh, try to uh, summarize some uh, takeaway message from this uh, presentation and discussion. First, for me, this is a really very useful, informative, and insightful. From your presentation and discussion, we learn that this concept is not so new for many countries in the region. Even though they have different names, but they have plenty of experiences. Already they have well-established mechanisms, very strong government policy support, and good practices already. We also learned that the scope is much wider than we thought. It is not limited to a few agricultural products. The processed food, fishery products, livestock, even forestry products, and the combining with uh, agro-tourism or convergence of industries. We also learned that even though it started with uh, the concept of one village, one product, it has evolved with the adaptation to fit for purpose in different contexts. We need to highly appreciate this. I think this is very, very important. There is no one size fits all approach in this initiative. I want to underline no one size fits all approach. I clearly heard your recommendation, very useful, very relevant. I think those are really the role for FAO to support member countries, to facilitate their implementation. The idea to establish a platform or forum to share and exchange the knowledge, experience, good practices, lessons learned. I think this is a great idea. And this is exactly what FAO should do. We, the regional office of FAO for Asia and Pacific, will be very happy to pilot this. I think this webinar is perhaps the first step towards this uh, platform or forum. We'll continue to discuss with uh, 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 the member countries through our country offices to uh, establish a solid uh, platform to support this. I also heard how FAO can support member countries to address challenges to solve the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the bottlenecks technical assistance, our normative roles or standards, and the facilitation for trade, improving or enhancing connectivity. I think those are all very important aspects. So again, uh, let me conclude with uh, 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 great thanks to all of you. And you, if you uh, allow us, with your uh, uh, permission, uh, we would like to uh, use the, the recording of this session to widely share with our colleagues in the headquarters and our colleagues in the regional office and this, uh, even uh, some uh, external partners to consult how we can uh, make progress in this very uh, important initiative, which has been tested and proven to be efficient and effective for rural development and uh, improving the income 
for rural population. So eventually uh, addressing the SDGs, particularly SDG 1, SDG 2, and SDG 10. So again, uh, I want to thank you very much for all the presenters, all the participants for great, great presentation and uh, excellent discussion and uh, very useful recommendations. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sirida. Well, thank you all uh, for, uh, for being here and thank you all for uh, helping us to prepare for this and for all your collaboration and cooperation when we did the video recordings. It was, I know all of you had respective challenges, but thank you uh, once again. And as, uh, as Mr. Kim said, this is only the start. This is the beginning of a conversation and the process as this initiative develops. And as we get in and incorporate all your ideas, we'll be consulting you more and more in the weeks and months to come. So we will look forward to being, being in touch with you. And with your permission, we will be sharing all the presentations that you've made and the recording of this webinar with headquarters and all our other offices. So thank you, have a good day and please stay safe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.